Okay, let's begin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name, uh, for those of you who don't know me, is Leo Chalupa. I'm Vice President for Research here at GW. And this is the third of kind of our workshops uh, arranged by Andrea Phillips from my office to uh, promote our faculty and make them more successful in getting grants. The previous two uh, were devoted to research grants. This one's a little bit different in the sense that what we're doing here, we're going to be talking about personal, uh, uh, personal awards in which people can get fellowships that are considered to be of high distinction. Now, I can tell you uh, from personal experience that I was lucky enough to get one of these very early in my career when I was at the University of California. I received a Guggenheim, and it was really a transformational um, moment in my career. I was able to go uh, to Cambridge University for a year, uh, working with a very preeminent person in my field, and, I, and I, it was just really a career-changing thing, not so much for what I got done that year, but for all the people I got to know and uh, that had impact on my life uh, and still do all these many years later. So uh, probably the best way to proceed here would be I want to introduce five individuals that have been recipient, uh, these are GW faculty, that have been recipient of these prestigious uh, awards. And I have asked each of them to just tell, them, tell you in rather informal sense their experience about this, how they uh, went about getting an award, what it meant, and so on. And the purpose of this whole thing is to encourage you and other people that are your friends and colleagues who may not be able to be here to apply for these things. The bottom line is uh, you're not going to get one unless you put your head in the ring. And from a lot of these things, the application process is much, much, much briefer and less onerous than doing a grant application. In a few cases, it's only four or five pages. So there isn't a tremendous amount of work done. It's, it's usually quality rather than quantity that counts in these applications. And what we like to do is, is to have th these faculty members relate their experience. And then I want to let you know that if you have any interest in this, please contact Andrea Phillips in my office. And she will serve as a conduit by which she can connect you with the whole, the whole process of how to get one of these things and also provide linkage with faculty in your area who have had experience with this, who could serve as mentors for this. So you know, we're trying to in increase the number of GW faculty that get that gets these prestigious awards. Before we begin, I want to introduce um, Kim Connor. Would you, would you please stand up? She's a fellow specialist at the uh, Woldruff Wilson Center, which is on Pennsylvania Avenue, walking distance to here in the Reagan Building. And uh, I'm going to ask her to say a few words uh, from sort of the, the inside the bunker, uh, how these things work after we go through our panel. So I'm going to ask each of our faculty members if they can identify themselves and uh, give their affiliation rather than me doing that. And then we'll go in order this way and then talk about um, what reward they received and about their experience. I guess okay, we could speak. This is being uh, taped, by the way, for those who can't come here. So please speak into the microphone. I'm Dennis Johnson, I'm a professor of political management at the Graduate School of Political Management. And last year, 2010, 2011, I was in China as a Fulbright Distinguished Professor uh, uh, in China. Um, I'm Jeffrey Cohen, I'm from the English Department. I'm the director of the GW Medieval and Early Modern Studies Institute. And right now, actually, the reason I'm not wearing a tie is because I'm on fellowship leave, uh, which began with the ritual burning of a tie. And, and no, I, um, so I have a Guggenheim Fellowship and an American Council for Learned Societies Fellowship for the second time. And those fellowships are actually very similar to get. Um, you know, I'll talk about those. Hi, I'm Henry Farrell. I'm an associate professor of political science and international affairs here at the Department of Political Science and the Elliott School. Last year, I had a fellowship at the Woodrow Wilson Center, which uh, Kim is going to tell you about uh, in some detail. And I will talk a little bit about that from the applicant's perspective. Hi, I'm Stephen Tuck, Chair of the Sociology Department uh, here at GW. Uh, the reason I'm not wearing a tie is because I don't own one. Uh, last year, I was a, a research Fulbright uh, scholar at Jagiellonian University in uh, Kraków, Poland, and I'll look forward to sharing some of those experiences with you shortly. 
And I'm Janet Phoenix. I'm an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Health Policy in the School of Public Health. And in the 2008-2009 uh, time frame, I was a Robert Wood Johnson Health Policy Fellow, um, the year of the Affordable Care Act. And I'll tell you more about that a little later on. Okay, well, so those are the panelists. And uh, let's start with uh, Professor Johnson. And if you would tell uh, the audience about your experience with your uh, prestigious Fulbright. Yeah, again, I was a Fulbright professor in China. Um, this was my second time trying out for a Fulbright. I tried about three or four years ago uh, in Australia, which is called the, uh, the Fulbright Chair of Political Science in Australia. It's a hard one to get because a lot of people applied for that one. I came in second. Um, I don't think they understood political management. Uh, Henry and his people in political science don't understand it either. So how would, uh, how would people in Australia understand applied politics versus theoretical side? But the, the second time around was uh, for this one in China. And I said, well, I'll give it another try, see what happens. And I told the people in my application, I said, well, <clears throat> you turned me down last time, but you, I was second. And since then, I published three books, and I've learned Chinese. Uh, does that help? <laughs> well, it, 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 it did sort of, but the, the key to understand that is that the people who made up the decision for Australia were different from the people who made up the decision for China, so it didn't really matter uh, about that. But it was a, a very interesting experience for me. Uh, I took my wife with me. Uh, we were basically on our honeymoon. We had been married for six weeks, and we went together to, to China. If you decide uh, that you'd like to uh, try this, this was a teaching uh, experience as opposed to a research experience. Um, it was the hardest teaching I had ever done in my life. Uh, to take what you normally do in a classroom, pull it back to maybe a junior high school level, Try to get as much as you can from Gelman Library across the sea in terms of English language stuff that, that the, the kids could read. It was very, very difficult, but a very rewarding experience. I have to tell you that the, the key thing for me in this application, incidentally, applications, I think, are due May the 1st. So if you're thinking of, of a Fulbright, it's a good time to start thinking about it. I, I prepared the application. It was only three or four pages long, and I thought, well, this is, this is fine. I showed it to several of my colleagues, and they said, yeah, it looks pretty good. You got every word spelled right, you know, all that stuff. And then finally, a light bulb went off in my head, and this is the, absolutely the most important thing, and it's, it's almost like your mother telling you to put mittens on in Christmas night. Why don't I call up the program specialist? who is going to look at these things, all the applications for China, and ask him what they're looking for. And I did that, and he said, oh, no, your application is fine, but why don't you move it this way? The Chinese like this better than this. So I did. And that was, this, that was this, you know, it's, it's, it sounds so stupid and so simple, but it was the best advice I, and I, you know, to, to, to talk to these people individually. So it was a, an excellent experience. If you do plan to think about going abroad, don't go by yourself. Don't go by yourself. I've had so many people I know who've, who've gone abroad as a Fulbrighter who've regretted it. They felt lonely. They felt isolated. If you can go with someone else, please do. Yeah, so get married first and then uh, <laughs> go on home. So two great lessons here, I, I think, and that's true for a lot of things. One is uh, if you don't succeed at first, you know, after you get rid of, uh, past the, uh, the, the crying and the drinking, try again. Because uh, uh, there are no guarantees. And, and sometimes it's three times and four times and so on. Um, in my experience, and I, th I think it's, uh, I, I can say this very honestly, uh, persistence pays off the number one factor in getting funded. And, and regular grants and these kinds of things, persistence. People who expect to get, get a one shot you usually don't ever get it. And then the second thing you heard, I think, which is really important, is call up the person. You know, we, the great advantage, you always hear from, from uh, President Knapp and others about the, uh, the, the uh, George Washington University advantage. We're in D.C. Well, for me, what that means is you can talk to these people. We, we have a, a, a specialist right here. You can call them up. You can walk over there. You can have lunch with them, whatever. It gives you 
a, a, a distinct advantage because uh, many times they will tell you exactly what they told Professor uh, Johnson. So, uh, uh, Professor Cohen, would you like to uh, speak sure. about the Guggenheim? Um, so, my, I'm pretty methodical in, in almost everything that I do, and I don't like to waste time. I, I feel like as an academic, we're asked to do so many endeavors, many of which can be potential time wasters. So I think the way to approach the Guggenheim, or really any fellowship, is to think not in terms of, won't it be great to get it, and won't that be the, the best thing ever, but more, what will I get out of this process no matter what the outcome is? Because let's face it, hundreds of people apply for these things, very few are selected. So the way for me approaching it that, that's really worked is, okay, even if I don't get the fellowship, I get a really good book proposal, I get a, a clarification of my project, I get, I get some sort of product that's useful at the end. And if you think about it in those terms, then what you need to do to make it a success, I think, comes naturally, which is share it and share it with as many people as possible. Talk about it all the time, because the more you talk about it, the more it crystallizes. Think about it as participating in a genre, because there's a genre of fellowship writing that's very similar to things like pitching a book, but also it's its own thing. So look on the web, check out who's actually been successfully funded, look at the little paragraphs that each person has. Usually that's called from their abstract from that application. It gives you a good idea of how to speak in that application. Also gives you a good idea of what kinds of projects tend to get funded because history always repeats with these organizations. They have certain preferences. Also, use the web to help you to find people to connect with. Very often, people who have been successful at getting these fellowships are also happy to look at your application or at least speak to you about it. Very often, too, they, in fact, have been evaluators for that same body. And finally, the last thing I'll say is always make sure that you never talk at a, at a level that's either too high or too low for your evaluators. That is, nobody wants to be made to feel stupid. I think especially when we're inside a project, it can be hard to explain. You want to use the most straightforward language possible. Um, that always works better. And again, just look for other people's examples. I, I think that really helps. Yeah, that's great. I'll just um, reinforce the last point, that these things are not read the way grants are read people who are evaluating them are not necessarily right there in your area. So if you write it as if you would for your peers, they won't be able to understand it. They may be in a general area. So I think, I think that's a very good point. Uh, write it so that your Uncle Harry or Aunt Harriet understands it because uh, somebody like that could be reviewing it. The other thing, I don't know if you agree with this, Jeffrey, but, but I was told, and I used this when I uh, had applied and gotten Guggenheim was, that they uh, favored applications. You need three letters of recommendation, three letters of reference, so to speak. Uh, they favored, they favored um, applications that had people who had been former Guggenheim holders as writing letters of support. And I did that. I happened to, you know, one of the peop one of, uh, persons I didn't know very well, I just approached and, and she agreed to do it. So, and, and since then I've written probably 20 or 30 letters for people who are applying for Guggenheims, and I was always able to say, as a former Guggenheim fellow, I feel that this application is blah, 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 like that. It, you know, it just stands to reason that it carries weight. I don't know if, that, if you agree with that. Very great. Okay, uh, Professor Farrell, please. Okay, so I was a, uh, I had a fellowship last year at the Woodrow Wilson Center. It was my second time applying. I, I had applied the previous year as well and had been shortlisted. And I wish I could say that I was methodical in the same way that Jeffrey was. Uh, I was not. I did get in contact with the uh, people and specifically with Kim, but in the context of trying to figure out whether I was going to be accepted or not accepted on the program. And that began a process of dialogue, which also gave me a lot of insights uh, 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 Kim was not herself directly involved in deciding who was selected or who was not selected, but was intimately familiar with the process and was therefore able to give me a lot of insight into the ways in which my application, while it had been uh, quite attractive, it had been shortlisted, could be improved, and indeed was improved for the uh, second leg of the thing. So, uh, so it is important to think of this as a process. If you don't get accepted the first time around, then uh, get as much feedback as you possibly can. Uh, treat this feedback 
feedback as valuable information and feed it back into a second revised proposal. And this is, I think, especially important with, uh, you know, it depends from funding organization to funding organization. If you're working with uh, foundations, I, uh, since then I have applied to the Open Society Institute. Uh, there are some foundations or organizations which really want you to shape your application in important ways. And so they see the uh, sort of first thing that you put in as basically being the first gambit in an ongoing dialogue where they're going to say, we want you to do this, do this instead, think about this, think about this other thing instead, write a revised proposal, they then tell you, well, it needs more of this. And so you really want to think about this as being a process. It's also important to think about the institution uh, that you're applying to and think about what, how it is that the kinds of things that you are talking about, are interested in doing, fit into their objectives, fit into the kinds of things that they need to do. Because all of these institutions have their own internal bureaucracies, they all have their own stated goals and purposes, and they all have people who have to justify the choices that they make over these highly prestigious, very selective awards they have to have people who justify the uh, choices that they have made over who gets this and who does not get this in terms of the uh, in terms of the values uh, of the particular institution and the stated goals of that institution. So you want to, to read that and you also want to be absolutely clear about the ways in which your own work contributes to those goals. Don't think that people are going to be able to infer this by magic, that they're going to have the same understanding of the awesome, wonderful uh, uh, applications or implications of your proposal for uh, forums or whatever it is that the institution does unless you spell this out specifically and clearly and precisely in your proposal. I think it's also uh, important to be cl as clear as you can about what the final work product is going to be, about what it's going to look like. Uh, the people who are evaluating this are uh, typically going to be, in, at least in my case, uh, academics themselves. They know that very often the, pro the uh, project changes dramatically in the process of its making. Nonetheless, if you have a clear roadmap uh, when you go into the thing, even if you deviate from that roadmap later, it suggests that at least you're somebody who has an organized project, has an organized way of thinking about stuff, and when you face a roadblock, that you're going to be able to get through it. And the final piece of advice, and this is a very uh, uh, you know, sort of a very obvious piece of advice, but people very often don't uh, don't adhere to it as well as they could. Read the uh, instructions very carefully. Make sure that you do all that you're asked to do, that you jump through the hoops you've been asked to jump through, because these are incredibly difficult decisions which people at the other end have to make between a whole bunch of very attractive proposals. If you have something which is a, a sort of a minor, a sort of tick or whatever, this may be enough to, uh, to uh, make you that slight bit less competitive in comparison to the other wonderful proposals in your pool and hence result in somebody else getting selected and you not being selected. Well, that was great. Okay, uh, Professor Stephen Tush, please. Thank you. Uh, again, I was a Fulbright Fellow in Poland last year at the Institute of Sociology at Jagiellonian University. My story of persistence is a bit different than the other speakers. Um, I was, uh, this was actually my second Fulbright Award last year. Um, in the 1997-98 academic year, I was a uh, Fulbright, I got a Fulbright Teaching Award, uh, also in Krakow in, in Poland at Jagiellonian University. And when I got to thinking about applying for the second one, I called CIES and asked them if what their policy was on, on uh, applicants requesting to go back to the same country that they had been a fellow in before, and they told me it, it almost never happens. They recommended that I uh, look in other countries in the region. So I looked at what was uh, posted in Czech Republic, looked in Hungary, a couple of other countries, and nothing interested me. So I decided that um, uh, I would go ahead and apply nonetheless to uh, go to Poland for Fulbright application, you've got to pick a country, one country. And I decided that uh, since, uh, according to what CIS told me, uh, I was not going to get funded to go back, I decided I might as well apply and not get funded uh, for research as opposed to a teaching Fulbright. Uh, and I got it. So <laughs> um, it worked out, my persistence in that, uh, um, in that case. Um, I would add a couple of, uh, uh, just a couple of things to what others have said. In terms of the Fulbright application specifically, uh, it's really important, uh, sounds you know, straightforward, but uh, um, it's not often, it's not always followed, this advice. It's really important to indicate in the application why you need to be in country. Uh, really key. And the folks who are reading these, uh, these uh, proposals, 
they're just five pages, as for Fulbright uh, um, applications, as Leo, Leo suggested. The folks who are reading these applications obviously know, you know who needs to be in country and who doesn't. And when I say um, justify why you need to be in country, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to uh, propose engaging in primary data collection. I'm a survey methodologist. I take my data with me on my laptop. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, engaging in uh, data collection in the country. But some some uh, reason, some, some justification of, for being in country, whether it's to uh, explore archives, to uh, gain access to, um, uh, in my case, Polish language uh, sources, have some reason that uh, links you uh, to that country. And se uh, a second um, a point that I would mention is that it's always useful uh, to point out what your host university will gain uh, would gain by your affiliation with uh, uh, with them. Host universities. I was in Eastern Europe, but but this applies to host universities anywhere. They gain some prestige. The host does by having a Fulbright fellow um, uh, come and spend a year or spend a semester with them. Uh, in terms of pre-application uh, activity, um, the key part or a key part of the pre-application prior to even submitting the application, which I think is is actually due on August. 1st, First, depending upon the, the program. The core program uh, applications are due, at, um, I still, I think still, August 1st of the year prior to, um, a year in advance prior to uh, uh, the award year. Um, it's, it's important to have, when you're applying for Fulbright, an uh, international host. Uh, Fulbright uh, requires a, a short letter saying essentially that if this person uh, is funded, uh, he or she can uh, uh, hang uh, their hat uh, in our university, in our institute, uh, in our program, and uh, uh, teach a course or two if it's a teaching Fulbright, or connect with uh, like-minded uh, um, scholars in the country if it's a research Fulbright. Uh, and that's an uh, important uh, part of the application. Um, if you don't have foreign colleagues, um, my recommendation is to uh, develop a, a network of, of, of international colleagues, and it's, it's, it's actually pretty easy to do. Uh, attend international conferences, uh, um, network with uh, others who attend those conferences, and importantly, host uh, host other scholars, international scholars here at GW. I've hosted several scholars over the years, uh, one Fulbrighter and a couple of other uh, um, uh, scholars who had uh, um, their own their own funding, and um, that's important as well to uh, um, to understand what it takes to uh, to be a good uh, host of a uh, of a uh, for for an international scholar. And Fulbright likes to uh, likes to see that too. Um, so those are a couple of uh, couple of um, uh, Hints that I would uh, that I would recommend. Okay, so that's great. So I assume pan mówi po polsku. Ja mówię tylko trochę po polsku. Bardzo dobrze, panie. I just I just used up my Polish. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Poland uh, a couple of years ago in Krakow, actually, yeah. for a brain conference, brain research conference, and I practiced how to say, "Do you speak Polish?" So I got, I got off the plane. I walked up to these tough-looking Polish taxi drivers, and I said. You speak Polish? <laughs> they were stunned. And one guy uh, said, he says, well, some people think I do. You just called me a woman, by the way, Leanna. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder no one they looked funny right. at me like that. All right, so our final speaker is Professor uh, Janet Phoenix. Please. So um, I'm Janet Phoenix, and in the 2008-2009 time frame, um, I had the opportunity of um, spending a year on the Hill. Um, I worked in the office of Senator Orrin Hatch. I worked on the Affordable Care Act, and um, it was an experience that I, I would have to say was transformative, uh, life-changing. Um, when I applied for the fellowship, I, it was actually before I received my faculty appointment here at GW. Um, the faculty appointment came one month before the acceptance letter for the fellowship. So I actually postponed um, my time on the Hill by a year, and that worked out marvelously because I landed on the Hill at a time when health policy um, uh, was really um, uh, at the forefront and, and got an opportunity to work not only for Senate Finance but also for um, the Senate Health Committee um, at a time you know that will go down in history as one of the most important times to work on health policy. The RWJ Health Policy Fellowship is intended for mid-career, mid-level career professionals. So it helps to have a little bit of gray in your beard or to be a little bit long in the tooth, and fortunately I qualified. 
um, on that on that score. Um, they really are looking for people who have some expertise, who they can share with the policymakers, so that you can bring um, uh, some knowledge and expertise um, to your uh, appointment on the Hill and be of use to people who are working on one of the health committees, either in, on the Senate side, on the House side, or in the administration. Some people do choose to take an appointment in the administration, working in health and human services, for example. Um, and so if you, if you are a physician, if you're a nurse, if you have a doctoral degree in a health-related field, um, this would be a wonderful opportunity uh, for you to consider. Um, and the competition uh, for the Health Policy Fellowship may not be as stiff as you would think. Um, it, hundreds of people are not applying, but dozens are. Um, and if you can make a case that your background is unique, I think I may have been selected because I had um, 15 to 20 years of experience working on environmental health issues at a time when um, that made my background somewhat unique, made me stand out a bit from the applicant pool, and I think that's how I ended up uh, being on the Hill. It Usually, uh, you end up working in an office where you are called upon to come up to speed on issues that may not be germane to what you've worked on in your career. Um, and, and sometimes there's a lucky uh, set of circumstances that allows you to really work on something that you know something about. Um, pandemic flu happened while I was on the Hill, so suddenly I was the go-to person. Um, because I had a background in environmental health, I was a physician, I found myself in a room advising um, some of the um, heads of the military organizations about how to better prepare um, for what might have been a really devastating uh, pandemic flu and how to make sure that vaccine supplies um, could be mobilized in time and, and you know what kinds of precautions needed to be put into place. It's an amazing opportunity to see the sausage making up close and that's its strength, that's also its weakness. Um, you know, you really come away with a better understanding of what's possible and what's not possible and it's a very uh, sobering experience. It was especially sobering for me because I'd always grown up here. I'd grown up here in Washington, you know, with Capitol Hill kind of in the, sh in the background um, and, and I'd always held it in awe and I realized that, you know, our policymakers put their pants on one leg at a time just like everyone else after the experience was over. Um, I strongly encourage you to do it. Um, we have some very distinguished alum, um, alumni, um, policy alumni who are affiliated with the university. Probably the best known is David Michaels, who's now head of OSHA, who was my department chairperson um, when I um, applied for the fellowship and who encouraged me to apply. Um, I can say that um, it's, it's very, very helpful and certainly heartwarming to know that Senator Hatch remembers me um, and that so much so that I actually got a condolence card when my mother-in-law passed away, which of course my husband and I framed. Um, but it's more important that the chief of staff who worked in the office when I was there is now the ranking chief of staff for the Senate Finance Committee and returns my emails. You know, that kind of influence when you're here in Washington <laughs> is invaluable. Um, whether you're interested in eventually, um, you know, developing more of a policy background for your work here at the university, or whether you eventually want to end up uh, getting an appointment in the administration. Um, this experience can really pave the way for that. Um, it's really a very good way um, to build that kind of background into your career. And the benefits for the institution, of course, are priceless, I would say. Um, you, can see, you can see why these people have been successful, how articulate they are. Very impressive. So I'd like to open this up to a general kind of discussion, questions and so on, but we, before we do that, um, Kim Connor has kindly invited, uh, kindly uh, consented to uh, accepting my invitation to speak a little bit about from the other perspective because she is the fellowship specialist at the uh, Woodrow Wilson Center. So if you want to come up and just uh, say a few remarks about, about what's it like being a fellowship specialist, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to say how appreciative I am of the chance to come and talk to you today. It's, it's nice to uh, talk one-on-one. -on -one. I find, just as Henry was saying, that um, it makes such a difference to actually talk um, to people at the center or wherever you're applying. Um, we can give you insights into how to apply and what to look 
what the reviewers look for. Everything Henry said is spot on. Um, I've had some uh, some scholars who've applied and gotten it on the fourth try. Hopefully, no one has to do it four times. But um, it's uh, what I do is I can actually give you feedback from the review panels, which is invaluable. Not only if you're applying for the Wilson Center again, but if you're applying for another fellowship, you can use those comments. Um, for, for whatever you're, you're going forward on. Um, we actually have a really uh, great tradition of GW scholars at the center. Um, just in the last few years, we've had Nathan Brown, we've had Kimberly Morgan. Uh, last year we had Henry, Greg Brzezinski. Uh, this year we have Eric Arneson, who's a history professor, um, working on a biography. He's been wonderful. Um, and I want to say thank you to Henry, too. Henry uh, was just sort of one of those model fellows at the center, just a fantastic colleague, and uh, we miss him terribly, so I was really happy to to come today to, to see Henry and everyone. Um, just want to say just a few words specifically on fellowships. We have different kinds of, um, of appointments at the, at the center, um, but just for uh, time's sake, I'll talk specifically to the fellowships, which is what Henry had at the center. Um, at any given time, we have between 70 and 80 scholars and residents at the center, and it is a residential fellowship, so you do work out of an office at the center. You have a research assistant, um, and I have to say we have one of the, I think, the best um, internship programs anywhere. I mean, these are fantastic students, many of them um, upperclassmen or graduate students, um, and so they can help you with your research. Um, we have a fantastic library staff. Um, uh, we have Library of Congress loan privileges, which is very rare. I think only the Smithsonian, some Smithsonian offices might be able to do that too, but um, to actually have the books in your office, have the materials in your office from the Library of Congress is a real, I think a real treat for everybody. And we have a fantastic library um, and support. So um, our we have an annual competition. So our deadline every year is October 1. Uh, so for this year, we're right now in the middle of the process um, in the review panels. Um, and so for um, our next deadline would be October 1, 2012. And this would be for the following academic year, um, which would be September 2013. So that would be the soonest you could start if you applied um, in the next competition. Um, uh, we are online, so more than 95% of our applicants applied online last year, which is which is great. Um, and your referees can also send their reference letters online. So, um, basic eligibility: you must have your PhD. Um, as an academic, you should have at least one published book. Um, and uh, you can be at all different stages of your career. We have assistant professors, associate professors, full professors, uh, practitioners, government um, officials, journalists. Um, it just really runs the gamut um, in all different fields, political science, international relations, sociology. Um, we are broadly based social sciences and humanities. So um, uh, the application process, um, uh, consists of the application form, a um, list of your publications, uh, a bibliography, two letters of reference, and the project proposal, which, as others have said, is really the most important part of the entire process. Um, and it is short. It's five single space pages at the most. And I really encourage um, everyone to use the five pages if you can. Um, I sometimes will get a proposal two pages, and I will, unlike a lot of grants at organizations, I will actually call the applicant and say, you need to send me and more because it's not you're not going to get through on two pages and um, there's kind of no way you can really cover all the questions in that amount so so use all the use the five pages if you can and kind of try to answer each of the questions um, one thing that's changed a little bit this year from when Henry was um, at the center um, we are looking more broadly at certain themes at the center um, where this is a new kind of a new direction for us we have a new director Jane Harmon who just started about a year ago um, so we have lots of new initiatives um, and so we do have um, three kind of major themes, um, which are global sustainability and security, um, regional power shifts, and American challenges as a superpower. And a lot can fit under there. Um, so I was worried at first. I thought, oh gosh, what's going to happen to our historians? What's going to happen to certain fields? And I've been really happy to say that in the review process this year, the historians are in there. Um, you know, it's it, these seem these are not um, you know narrow. These there are, there's a lot of ways you can bring this into the themes, and I'm happy to help anybody do that sort of one on one. If you want to talk about your project, and I can say, well, let's think about the themes here. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to fit into a theme, but um, the way it's looking this year is that it's, it would help considerably if it did. So. Um, uh, we, the fellows are chosen through external review, so these, as um, uh, I think a lot of, of these are, um, these are uh, panels of your peers, scholars, academics, 
uh, uh, practitioners. Uh, and so they actually review all the applications. We divide them um, among regions and topics. And so the top of each group, for instance, um, this was brought up earlier, we might have a Latin America, Middle East, Africa um, panel. And so you're going to have uh, five panelists who all are, you know, they're kind of the broad spectrum of these. And so you have to sort of talk in your, talk to everyone in your proposal. Um, the things I hear a lot of times are it's very jargony. They don't like that. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's certain things like that. They're th um, they look for, um, you know, something very concise. They can kind of get it. Um, what you don't want is a lot of questions after they read it. So um, as, as many of the panelists said, you show it to a colleague. I always recommend that. Um, show it to colleagues outside your field. Um, if they have questions, chances are the review panel is going to, they're going to have questions too. Um, and so it's all done by external panel review. Um, a few things I'll just sort of give you some insider things on what the, the panels always talk about. It, at every, every panel meeting. And they do come to the center and discuss the application. So there is that discussion, which I think really helps. You're not, uh, you don't have a reviewer just looking at something um, uh, on their own without having others to talk to about it and go, oh, well, why didn't you like this person? They were great. And then the discussion starts, and the next thing you know, they're in. So I think that helps a lot. Um, but is it policy relevant? Um, uh, we like we are a bipartisan institution in Washington, and so we like to be the go-to for policymakers. We like policymakers to think, "Oh, someone's working on China at the Wilson Center. Let's go talk to them." Um, and so that's what um, a big part of what we're about. Um, and so, is it policy relevant? That has to be um, in the proposal. Um, and also, uh, you know, again, how they relate to the themes, that's now an, another important component. They look at your publications record, um, you know, that you have published a book, um, you know, what you've published recently. Is this sort of, is this different from what you've published before? Um, it has to be separate from your dissertation um, work. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, to finish, um, just to kind of give you a, a few quick things about the fellowships, they are federally funded. Um, so we do offer a stipend up to $85,000 a year. Um, because we're fe we get a federal appropriation, um, it's kind of across the board. We've, that's about as much, as high as we can go. Um, because we try to take between 21 and 25 fellows each year. Uh, this year we had 300 applicants. Um, and uh, we have uh, 23 fellows at the center this year. We had 24 in Henry's year. So it's, it's usually around 21, 22, 23, something like that. Um, um, and I think um, that's too much. I, I did bring some brochures in my card, um, and I um, I really just urge you to um, you know as, as Henry said when we were able to talk on the phone, it's like well you know let's talk about your project, let's see what you're working on, and these are ways you can frame it, and um, and this is what the reviewers are going to look for. And actually, after this last process, I'll be able to even give you more pointers because this is sort of a new year for all of us too, and, and new criteria. So. Um, I can kind of let you know how that all went. Um, but I'm happy to, you know, talk to anyone. If you want to come for a tour of the center as well, I'll show you around. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks. So let's open it up for questions or comments from uh, folks out there. Uh, since this is being videotaped, what I'm going to do is if you, if you, if you repeat, your, repeat your comment or question so that it gets on tape because we don't have a microphone. In. So the question was, as a junior faculty member, can uh, one contact the people on my staff? I would say, not the people on my staff, contact me. Come over, my door's open, sit down, I'll get you a cup of coffee, and we'll talk about it. Okay? My job, my job, and the job of everybody in my office is to promote research here. And so, if you talk to people in my office, you know, you walk up to the sixth floor. I haven't seen you there yet, but uh, you're, you're welcome to come. Uh, the rule is my, my door is open about 90% of the time. Anybody can come in. Anybody. So just walk in and say, hi, I want to talk to you. And, uh, and basically, I'll stop writing the email I'm writing, telling somebody something they don't want to hear probably, and then we'll talk. So, or, or, or better yet, you know, I'll contact somebody in my office to set up an appointment, and that way uh, you'll know for sure I'll be there. But absolutely. Uh, and I think that uh, the sooner people get to know what's available, the better. In fact, we have, I don't know if you went through this, but we have an orientation for all new faculty when they come in. And there's, there's going to be a major push that's already started in my office for somebody to connect with every single new faculty member and tell him or her what we can do for you. 
because we're a service and our success is based on the success of the faculty. So, you know, so delighted to meet with you anytime, except real early in the morning, because that's when I run. Okay, anybody else? Yeah, so for the, uh, for the audience, the question was, if you haven't had a grant before, how do you become successful in getting a grant? Since it appears that in a lot of these applications, they expect you have had been funding before. So I'll answer it briefly, then maybe people here could just add, add their part. Uh, that is a problem, and, and it's a problem from different perspectives. One is that you know, experience counts in being successful in these things. And two is knowing how to put a grant together is a very important thing. When I first started out many, many years ago as a 29-year-old assistant professor, I couldn't get my first three grants funded. It was horrible. And uh, I, I want to go tell you the whole miserable experience, but it was the worst part of my career. And the reason I, didn't, I couldn't do it to a large degree is because I didn't know how to do it. You know, I never had written a grant before. It wasn't until I got a mentor. So one, of the, so one, one part of the answer I'll give you, and the panelists can g give their part, is find someone that can mentor you. And uh, you should speak to your associate dean or, or, or Dean Berman. And if you, and they don't help you, uh, contact uh, me or somebody in my office. We'll find you somebody that can help you through the process who has been successful in getting the grants. So that's number one. You know, uh, it's, it's a very important thing to somebody to take you to the process and tell you, don't do that. That's a mistake. Do this, that kind of thing. The other part of the thing that I could say is that uh, uh, work with someone that has a grant and, and be part of their application to start with. So somebody who's successful. So when it comes time for you to apply, you can say, well, I, I was part of a group or part of a, of a uh, collaborative project in the past. It's easy to get one of those things when you had, hit your wagon to somebody who is successful. But I'll let people uh, on here provide their input on that. Because it is an important question. I would say from my very limited experience on the other side of the fence, that is evaluating people's grants, <coughs> grant proposals or fellowship proposals as opposed to, uh, as opposed to uh, submitting them. It's a significant factor, but it is by no means a deal breaker. You know, what people are really looking for is information to see that you are somebody who is successfully capable of completing projects. One useful way of seeing that is whether or not you've been awarded fellowships in the past. Another is to see that you've got a highly successful, uh, you know, you've got a CV which has lots and lots of published articles, that you've got a book published in a good place. All of these also serve as alternative signals that you are somebody who uh, somebody who is uh, somebody who is uh, able to come up with the kinds of goods. And you, if, if you feel that this is a situation where it is a count against you, it may be worse. You know, specifically just having one or two sentences along the lines of because of my uh, profession, because their grants are grant opportunities or fellowship opportunities are limited in my area of the academy. I haven't done this. Nonetheless, I have this. this this and this, which shows how good I and how nicely suited I am going to be to your program. Anybody else want to add comments to that? I think I'm probably the oldest person here, uh, <laughs> and I'm a late bloomer. I am so thankful that this university now has, Leo, someone in your position with this kind of attitude of helping people. I never had this help when I was younger, when I was an assistant professor. I never had a, a, a good role model. I never had someone to take me under his or her wing and, and help me out with the process. Uh, I, and I think this is wonderful. And uh, I want to congratulate you for, for, for this and, and for everything you're doing, and particularly the attitude that I'm fairly young in my career, and I don't really know if I can go talk to Leo Chalupa or not. Damn straight you can. He's there to help. So thank you, Leah. I paid him $20 to say that. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Yeah, yeah so the question is, uh, is there an interview process? Uh, so I know Guggenheim doesn't have one. Uh, any of you, were you, anybody here was interviewed? You're yes. the only one, yeah. Um, the, actually, the interviews for the um, Health Policy Fellowship are going on today, and the program director, who's based at the National Academy of Sciences, wanted to be here, but she's interviewing the next class. Um, the interview process went on for a full day. 
um, there were three panels um, who interviewed each applicant, and it, it really was a very grueling process. I think the day that, that my interviews took place, there was a raging snowstorm. It didn't matter. Um, only one person failed to appear whose plane was stranded somewhere in the Midwest. Um, but yes, there were interviews. It was a group process. Um, uh, the questions that were posed were really, you know, very piercing, very thoughtful, and, and intended to really um, reveal how much you could bring to the experience, what your background was, and what you were going to do with the experience after the fellowship ended, um, which was an important component for the Health Policy Fellowship. Yeah, but I think it's fair to say that uh, that's a exception, the interviews. Most of these are not interviews. Uh, I think that's, that's right. You, you don't interview, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Just want to. We'll leave you uh, with a couple of final thoughts, uh, and and that is, no, apply. You know, uh, it doesn't. It, it, it's not a tremendous amount of work to do it. Uh, it's as have been said by a number of people, Professor Rosen and others. It's a it, it's a it's a good experience to get those thoughts down and so on. It, it help and it helps you in different things. And the other thing is that these things are, are different than sort of research applications to NIH to NSF. And from my own experience, I'll tell you this. I, I mentioned just a little while ago that I failed in getting my first three grants. I was denied by NIH twice and NSF once for a whole bunch of probably valid reasons. And I took, you know, what I thought was sort of the, the best of those failed grant ideas and put it into Guggenheim. Um, my, the chair of my department told me, I was wasting my time. It was ridiculous for me to even try to get this. Nobody in the history department ever had one. But I thought, you know, it's a weekend. And so I spent a weekend doing that, and I got it. So my point is that the federal agencies turned me down, and the Guggenheim, which is like, you know, one in 500 probably, uh, maybe, maybe even more than that, I got it. And uh, so, so uh, did, and I think the reason is because the federal agencies, the NIH, NSF, much more conservative. They wanted, you know, stuff that they thought was uh, going to be work for sure. While the Guggenheim uh, 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 grants, and I think it's probably true for these for Wilson and others, they're much more kind of adventurous. They're looking for stuff that's maybe innovative, and they're willing to take a risk more, and in investing in the right kind of people. So, so uh, I would urge everyone here to apply. We're happy to connect you with your peers that could help you. And I hope to see a major increase from GW in applications to these, to these various um, prestigious fellowships bodies. And more than that, I hope to see successful applications and successful candidates that we can write and brag about. Uh, you know, the, the big advantage of being in a place like Berkeley or MIT or Harvard or Yale is that you have a lot of people that have gotten these things, and so they help their own. We're trying to start that here. We have a lot of fantastic faculty. You saw a small sample here. There are a lot more that you guys know about. Utilize those people as a resource. I mean, I feel, you know, there's a moral obligation to help your colleagues to achieve excellence. And so, don't be shy, you know. If you can't find somebody, we'll find somebody for you. And I'll make a phone call and say, hey, uh, Joe, uh, could you please talk to so-and-so because they want to apply for something. So let's help each other to get up to the next level. And finally, I really very much want to thank uh, our panelists. I have to tell you, I, I, I was uh, extremely impressed, and I can see why you folks were so successful uh, in getting this. I wasn't sure how this was going to turn out, you know. Uh, but uh, thank you so much for doing it and, and, and taking the time to do this. And thank you all for coming.